Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for turning up on a Sunday afternoon. So what we thought was, you know, talking about future of health, it would be great to have a primer, uh, an introduction to the underlying issues and why healthcare is where it is today. So that was the idea. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk a lot about future as such, but I'm going to talk about what are the drivers, you know, and um, why we are here. So you know, if we start by looking at what, you know, what we want the future of health to be, right? So what is our ideal, uh, you know, what, what is ideal healthcare? What should we, what should we aim for? So the first thing would be to prevent disease and disability, right? So the ability to um, predict disease before it happens, before it becomes uh, difficult to reverse, you know, get it, you know, identify it as early as possible and fix it, right? So that would be, you know, one goal. You know, how do we do this is a key challenge for the future of health. The second is longevity. So we, we, want, we want to avoid diseases, we want to avoid uh, disability, but we want to, I mean, we want to do this for longevity, right? And longevity is sometimes a controversial topic when you talk about longevity for hundred, hundreds of years, right? So we, we, we are okay for longevity, which is 120, then after a while it gets a little bit controversial, but at any, any individual doesn't want to die. So, you know, longevity is, uh, you know, we would, would want, you know, everyone to live really long. I mean, it's not enough that we live longer. We want to enhance how we live. We want to enhance our capabilities, which is very possible, and there are already indications of this. So we want, we want uh, to enhance our capabilities to be superhuman, right? And, um, and this, is, this is one of the goals. So it's not enough to uh, live long, but you want to live well and you know, have as many experiences as you could have. And we want this for nothing. Right? So, so ultimately, you don't want to, this to be available only for billionaires. Right? We want this to be available for everyone. Right? Um, and we would have a situation, I guess, where it would be available only for millionaires and billionaires. It may not be available for everyone, and we are already starting to see uh, indications of that. So we want to we wanna get to a point where it is almost free. Right? So these are... These are our goalposts for uh, future of health, and we can see how um, uh, this can be achieved, and we can look at what are the challenges, why this is not the case already today, right? Why? Uh, because you know, data is kind of free now. We, there are so many things that are that are dramatically improved, but what is what is the challenge with healthcare that's causing us to be here? So you know, if you look at the hierarchy of, you know, so kind of repeating this point, if you look at the hierarchy of our focus with healthcare, I mean, at the, at the very basic level, we want to avoid premature death and disability, right? Then we want to move to wellness, and then we want to look at reversing aging, and then we want to be superhuman. So that's kind of the hierarchy of uh, our goals. So what I thought would be very interesting is to look at some interesting graphs and stats and concepts that might that might help us understanding uh, healthcare a little bit better and get an insight in terms of uh, how we could how we could uh, you know, change it. So, I mean, I find this graph really interesting. If you look at so this is the death rate by age group, right? And if you see it's really, you know, aging is the issue, right? So if, if, you, if you cross the one year mark uh, without, without problems, then for the next 30, 40 years, you're okay, right? Typically okay, right? And then it starts to go south uh, in terms of how, uh, you know, all sorts of things happen. It's not just death, but it's the same with hospitalization, right? So hospitalization dramatically changes after you're 45, 50. So it's really, <coughs> At the core, it looks like an aging issue, right? So if you are able to deal with aging better, if you are able to um, age healthily, 
you know, that's kind of what we are effectively uh, looking for. So if, then you ask the question, so what, how do you measure, how do you measure health? Or how do you measure, in this case, the burden of disease? Right? So uh, this is what we are trying to avoid. Right? So the idea of burden of disease is the number of years lost due to disability or death. So this is a great way to measure uh, across diseases, across a population, to look at what is the impact uh, of various diseases in one number. So very valuable uh, point of data that we can uh, we can measure, and this has been measured for a while now. And so if you look at so this is Dali, uh, disability adjusted like you know years lost, and. So between 1990 and 2010, what we've seen is there's almost a 25% drop in the disease burden. And so that's like a massive achievement. So in 20 years, we have removed a quarter of that burden. Right? With increasing population, with, you know, with all this, we have done this really well. So this is uh, daily per 100,000 people. So we have done this really, really well for an increased population. And we have done this well across all age groups, right? So we have done this uh, well for somebody who is, you know, less than five to all the way up to seventy plus. So we we made progress everywhere in the spectrum, right? So that's the good news. And if you see where where did we make those gains, and where did what were the gains, and what were the losses, right? So this is this is an interesting graph. I'm going to try and explain this. So what you see on the bottom are where we have decreased the burden, disease burden, right? What what you see on the top is the increase in disease burden, right? So this is all last 20 years. So 19, I mean I think this is 1990 to 2010. So what you see here is all the things that are in red are infectious diseases, right? So we've done really, really well in infectious diseases, right? I mean, except AIDS, which I think we would, we would in the next graph, in the, you know, if you do an update, you would have done really well. So we've been very successful when it's a pill that you need to pop or a vaccine or um, something like that. It's really easy to do. But where we're failing, where we're failing, including AIDS, it's a, li it's a lifestyle issue. Right, it's really, you know, we are failing with heart disease, stroke, back pain, diabetes, neck pain. You know, it's, those are things where we are really losing the battle. Right? So we are moving from infectious to uh, preventable uh, diseases. Right? And this is, this is a, uh, you know, this graph you know, shows so, so clearly where the problem is. So we are moving, you know, the problem has moved from, uh, you know, stopping somebody from getting malaria or uh, TB or AIDS to affecting their lifestyle and changing the way they live. So how can we, how can we affect this? How can we affect health as such? So if you look at what, what causes, what are the factors that affect health? And you see, there's only 10% which is uh, clinical care, right? Only 10% is clinical care, right? The rest is really outside the control of a hospital, right? It's really outside the hospital, right? So 10% is biology and genes, right? The rest, so the big, the, the big ones are the socioeconomic factors and health behaviors, right? So it's almost like if health is as much an economic, social, social challenge as much as a medical challenge, right? So healthcare has, has has to be much broader. If you want to deal with this really well, it's a really the issue is outside the hospital. We have been successful with the hospital with infectious diseases, but we have not been with uh, with preventable uh, diseases. So this is, you know, this is a, a diagram that really shows if somebody is poor and if they are in a bad housing, 
you know, basically poor, right? It changes. It makes it very, very, very difficult for them to uh, be healthy, right? So health, health is very related to poverty and uh, the socioeconomic conditions. And this is this kind of is a very interesting graph, which shows. So this is on the on the bottom is the income per person, right? So from hundred dollars to hundred thousand dollars, probably more. Um, but if you see, the lower you earn, the lower the life expectancy is, right? So it's you know the richer will live longer. So that's the idea up to a point, right? So if you know, after a while it stops being effective because that's only so much we know about medicine today that we can't really, with money, change uh, change the outcomes. You know, Steve Jobs exhibit A, right? So you know you can have billions of dollars, but you can't really fix you know, some things. Some things like that go wrong. And you know this is. This is another aspect of healthcare which is really uh, interesting. Basically, the what it shows here is the the fifty percent of population spends. This is U.S. data. Fifty percent of population spends about thirty six billion. So this is private spending, um, and the rest of the fifty percent spend one point two trillion. Right? So it's like a massive uh, difference, and the top five percent spend fifty percent. Right. 50% of the all the spending is by the top 5%. So, uh, you know, so it's a very different uh, problem if you if you look at it like this. So these are some of the ideas that I thought would be interesting to to uh, to note and influence how we think about uh, health. So if you ask, what's wrong with healthcare today, right? So the first one. Uh, I would say is, you know, you all think uh, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, but not really, not really for all cases. So we have we have been we have been good at doing this for some some areas, but clearly infectious. Its prevention is definitely better than yeah. The economics of that is well established, but it doesn't really spread to other aspects of healthcare really well. And this is a big challenge. And uh, and if you see a lot of insurance companies, you know, I've been looking at prevention and the economics of prevention. What what you're able to see very consistently is insurance companies and many payers, including governments, sometimes think it's actually cheaper to let people get sick and then fix them. It's actually cheaper, right? And this is this is a challenge. So this was this was a Mark Cuban's uh, tweet a tweet a um, couple of weeks ago. So he tweeted basically saying everybody should get if you can afford you should do a quarterly blood test. Right. So you should kind of start to build you know you should go and do your blood screening every uh, three months, every four months, and then it, it became a big controversy, and the controversy is not completely unfounded. Um, there are issues in terms of cost of screening, false positives, false negatives. You know, leading you know testing leading to unnecessary intervention. You know, this is a mess. So it's very very difficult to uh, to justify the cost of testing. It's very difficult to uh, deal with false positives and false negative um, uh, you know tests and the interventions that come out of it. Right? So you could really affect somebody. Uh, it's almost like uh, you went to a police station to file a complaint and you got shot accidentally. Right? So that's how, that's how it can happen in many cases where uh, the screening can lead to issues. Right? So there's this stat on prostate uh, cancer death. So you have to almost test about 1,000 people for a 10-year period every year to get to say one person, you know, dying from prostate cancer. That's a very difficult economic argument to make to anyone, including the patient, right? So, but 
you know, this is this is the current state of affairs. Right? So we we don't really know precisely what to look for when it is when it is benign, when it is not, um, when something is out of range, how to treat it. We have very little clue about this. If, but this should change, but this is the current state. And the issue is also, uh, you know, let's say if somebody is diagnosed and somebody is given medication, it doesn't work for everyone. Right? So our, medi our medication is really population based. So we, we, um, I mean, if you look at how clinical trials are done, how um, drugs are discovered, it's really based on a statistically significant population getting better from that drug. Right? It doesn't really matter to an individual whether it is statistically significant or not. It, you know, it's what matters is whether it works for that individual or not. Right? So, I mean, for the same drug, for the same diagnosis, for the same prescription, for some, you know, it would be uh, toxic and not beneficial. Right? So for some, it will be not toxic and beneficial. So this is the group that we want, but there are other groups that are paying and taking medication and suffering side effects, right? So there is people who are toxic but benefits them, not toxic, not beneficial, waste of money, right? So this is, this is a big challenge. So we spend a lot of money on medication and works for a fraction of people who take that medication, right? Because there is no way for us to personalize uh, medication uh, consistently everywhere. You know, <laughs> the sixth largest uh, reason for death uh, is medical errors, right? And besides death, if you see, you know, side effects, if you look at wrong diagnosis, if you look at uh, people having side effects, it's just the numbers are much, much more larger and we have no idea today because there's very little data on this. Right. The more we know, the more we are scared about doctors. Right. So, any doctors here? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, so we kind of realize how little uh, we understand the biology, uh, right? <laughs> and how little we, um, you know, we can predict what's going to happen. Right. And you know, these are preventable medical errors. So, there is so much human. Uh, interaction which leads to uh, a lot of these errors and you know so you know based on the, the fact that we don't have personalized medication we don't have uh, uh, you know not drug doesn't work for everyone very well we are you know we are we have to do trial and error right so we are going to uh, somebody is going to give medication, see if it works. If it doesn't work, they're going to change it. So it's very difficult to predict upfront what's going to work for you. Like what exactly is the problem and what's going to work for you? Very little data. So, and you know, there is very little data, and wherever there is data, it is disjointed. It is not connected. It's all over the place. It's you know, we we do a lot of tests over time, but we don't get the benefit of all those data. Um, you know, there is a diagnosis made, there is a, 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 you know, an allergy, a lot of this data is missed, right? Every time it's missed and, um, yeah, so there's one more slide which uh, I want to talk about this a bit more. On the other side, if you see, you know, drug development has become more and more and more expensive, right? So this. This leads to a situation where, uh, unless there is enough people who would buy a drug, there is no incentive to discover those drugs. Unless we change how we, did, you know, uh, discover drugs, how we make drugs, it's going to become more and more difficult. You know, not just drugs, but every procedure, every uh, aspect of healthcare is inflating at a crazy rate. Right, it's becoming more and more a bigger and bigger part of uh, the GDP. And you know, between the patient, the employer, the government, uh, the provider, uh, <laughs> the goals are very misaligned. Right, so we have very, uh, very uh, different goals, and sometimes it's in conflict with each other. 
I, and this is a this is a crazy problem as well. And this is a structural issue, uh, and nothing to do with medication. Patient experience, again, you know, it's the patient experience in our in the typical healthcare system is bad, right? And it is again a structural issue because it's not easy to provide great patient experience the way we are set up today, right? So. And so this is, you know, we have intelligence leaking out of the system all the time. There's no way to accumulate this intelligence, make use of this intelligence so that we can make better and better uh, use of this data. I mean, if you look at uh, aviation, if a flight goes down, you know, the amount of work that happens after that flight goes down, there's so much uh, research and analysis that's done on why it went down, then everybody benefits. The whole aviation industry benefits from that one mistake, right? Whether it is a hardware issue or a software issue, or you know the pilot locking the door, these issues are uh, systematically addressed, and everybody gets to know it. And then, as a result, aviation becomes more and more safe. If medi if medicine was as safe as aviation, it would be fantastic, right? I mean, medication is not safe at all. Right, I mean, in, in the, uh, they say in the, you know, in the 18th century, if you got sick, you have two choices. You could go to the priest or you could go to the doctor. And if you went to the priest, you are better off, <laughs> right? Because you are not going to be subject to unnecessary errors because we didn't know much then, right? So things have improved, but there's still a long way to go. So, so this is, I mean, so we saw some of the issues and we saw some of the challenges that we have. Now, you know, what I wanted to show are some trends uh, that are positively changing uh, the way healthcare is done. Um, you know, not all of them are moving at the same pace. Uh, you know, you would want, you would expect some uh, breakthroughs in some technologies for, for some of this to get really quick. So we're moving. We want to move from being reactive to preventive, and I think as as the cost of cost of testing becomes less, as the algorithms finding out what the issue is becomes more, as we become as we are able to connect all the data points together so that we can make the prediction better, we can find the right drug. It gets uh, you know, this can happen more and more. So we can move from a spray and pray medicine to a precision uh, process, right? So same same factors influencing uh, influencing this. So I mean, one, one, one more thing I want to talk about here in terms of precision. So you know, let's say with, with, when it comes to lifestyle, right? Um, one of the areas which I'm very actively uh, looking at now as a way to prevent diseases. The problem is we have very general uh, statements about. Uh, what one should do. So we would say something like ten, you know, walk 10,000 steps or you know, uh, have um, you know, this diet or that. But we, what we lack is precision, right? What we lack is the ability to say, for you, you, know, you need to walk 2,000 steps between eight and 10 to get the maximum effect, right? So, I mean, because effectively what we're doing is spray and pray, right? And that's why we're not getting sufficient engagement. When people are able to see exactly how it impacts, then it would start to get really better, right? So, population medicine to a personalized, uh, personalized healthcare, you know, beyond, medi beyond medicine, it's to be able to look at how to prevent, how to live a healthier life, how to, you know, how to optimize for productivity, right? How do, what do you, what do you do to be at the best uh, you can be? You know, instead of episodic, when you know, so currently um, the healthcare system is like uh, it's like a garage, right? So you don't go to the garage unless your car is broke, right? You go when once it is broke, right? So we can move away from that, uh, like some of the cars are already doing, having a computer on board. You start to analyze data, and then you can go and fix before things get bad, right? So we need onboard computers via uh, nanotechnology or sensors 
um, you know, as these technologies get better and better, we would have that onboard computer where somebody remotely can watch and talk to us only when there is a need, right? To say, okay, you need to you need to come in for something, and, uh, and then we don't have to worry about managing that. And you know, and healthcare has to really move from uh, healthcare facilities to to homes and offices, and in the uh, in the neighborhoods. So. I mean, these are these are the trends that uh, we want, and we are already seeing these trends happening uh, slowly uh, but surely, right? With with technologies, with uh, what is really interesting going forward is that not that there is one technology that's that's going to make all the difference. What's going to make all the difference is the convergence, right? So it's really how. We, so many of these technologies are coming together uh, to create an impact, right? So it's just not just the uh, not just uh, one one piece of technology. It's not just genetics. It's not just a biomics. It's not just uh, a mobile. Uh, all of them together um, dramatically changes the outcome. Right. So this is uh, I, I, I took a picture of uh, this from this book called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. Um, by Eric Top also, you know, people who are interested in healthcare, I would definitely recommend that book. Uh, it's, a, it's a very readable uh, uh, view of what's going to happen. You know, so, one of the great things about uh, some of the technologies are they are digital at the very core, right? When something is digital at the very core, uh, there are uh, some implications, right? And we have felt these implications in uh, we have felt these implications in a few areas already. We have seen this in travel. We have seen this in banking. We have seen this with um, in, in, in photography. We have seen this in many areas. So what happens when uh, when something gets digitized? The first thing is. For a period of time, it's very deceptive. So there are a lot of progress happening, but you wouldn't feel that progress. So it is kind of under the radar um, for a long time before it suddenly starts to make, uh, you know, make itself uh, seen. Uh, so I mean, I, I presume we are we are in a very deceptive phase in healthcare um, because it's going to take a while before uh, you know the these advances are going to make. Uh, that's have seen. So this is a graph of how the cost of sequencing a genome has changed over time. So what was what was hundred million dollars not long ago, but you know, in two thousand three, two thousand four, to less than a thousand now. <coughs> so that's like a massive improvement in uh, in performance per dollar, right? And we would see this in many different. Aspects of uh, of healthcare, and together, I think it's going to make make a big difference. So, you know, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, things are becoming easier and easier to access. Um, some of these devices provide, um, you know, critical data that you can have on your home without having to go to a hospital do a test. Things have become very very simple. In terms of knowing uh, uh, data, and um, we are also seeing bionics and prosthetics, which are getting really better and better. So, if you had a hearing aid 30 years ago compared to what you have now, the difference is huge, right? Um, you know, it's going to reach a we are going to reach a point where it's better to have the artificial uh, hearing than your actual hearing because it's going to do much better, right? So it's already starting to, uh, you know, uh, these are some examples which are very visible, uh, you know, great stories of people who lost their limbs and with, with, these, uh, with these robotic arms and legs are able to do much better, you know, I mean, not much better yet, but uh, starting to be uh, becoming on par. And uh, the, the, the thing is, this 
this uh, you know evolves very very rapidly, right? Whereas the rest of the body evolves, you know, it takes millions of years to evolve. So as we start to replace these parts, it's going to get uh, really interesting. And uh, yeah, so this is this is a bionic eye uh, that we're talking about, brain implants. Um, that can that can uh, you know stop seizures. So there are uh, so many so many uh, interesting technologies that is uh, that are coming up, which will address some of the challenges we saw. So yeah, with that um, uh, with that introduction, um, hand over to Julian to deep dive into the digital health space. Cool. Uh, thank you, Balaji. Why don't we stop a little bit for questions? I mean, a lot of them are U.S. data, so we don't have good data for the uh, rest of the world most of the time. Yeah. So but I think it should be representative. Yeah, you have this pie chart about the determinants of health. Right. So where is that? Where is the starting point? Uh, I can put some show notes on the uh, on the meetup. Oh, okay. So I'll put the, the links for these. Uh, with, uh, yeah, I'll put that in. Any? if prevention is less lucrative than the cure? Sorry, the cure is less, sorry, sorry. Um, what if it's better, it, it makes more money to treat a chronic disease than to cure it or prevent it? That's, already, that's the case today. Yeah. That's the case today and that's where, uh, that's the challenge. So uh, how are we going to solve the challenge? No, because, well, I mean, I think, uh, like we saw with a lot of uh, preventable chronic diseases, uh, it's not so much about the pharma company doing something or the hospitals doing something. It's outside, right? It's a, what do you do at your home? What do you do? So there are now a, a range of companies coming to help on the lifestyle. And this is going to make a big difference and they are outside. You know, it's not a hospital problem. No, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. right. The current challenge is that treating a disease is very expensive, pretty ad hoc. Um, and of course, people beat the bill or either yourself. Your insurance company or the government. There's three stakeholders already who want to change it. Yeah. So that's a big lever that we would be able to push with uh, digital health. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. I think you shared a little bit about the timeless uh, components of what drive what uh, people want and consumers want. But and I think we also know that you know, hospitals and doctors are kind of like you know, driving to see what it is. But I think you should mention a little bit about insurers being and very different goals uh, from both the kind of like medical side and as well as the patient side. What do you see will be the next kind of like 50 years? How do you see the insurance? No, 50 uh, years is too long. Maybe there is no insurance. <laughs> right? uh, because if we, are, if we are able to precisely predict risk, there is no place for insurance. Right? All, um, I do a bit of work with insurance companies. Um, all insurance companies will probably tell you, all CEO of insurance companies will probably tell you that they know that this is one of the next five, ten years of debt. Google will do insurance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Google is already doing insurance in the US. Car insurance, not body insurance yet, but it's not far behind. Why? Because Google has access to the most wide ranging data available. They know everything about it. They know you're going to buy a house six months ahead of the time you're buying a house. Why? Because you started looking at houses, mortgages, schools. Um, so most insurance companies are stepping into healthcare at the moment. stepping into healthcare. So AIA, for example, launched an accelerator, healthcare accelerator in Hong Kong last month. They're all recognizing that they need it to define a new purpose for themselves. Uh, in the prevention space, maybe you want to mention also what, uh, oh. for example, Yeah, so, uh, I mean, one of the things, I'm currently working on a, on a program, uh, it's a lifestyle intervention program uh, for people with pre-diabetes. So what we're trying to do is uh, a six months intervention where we can help somebody who is pre-diabetic to reverse and you know, avoid uh, becoming a diabetic. Cool. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so we'll take more questions then after Julian as well. <laughs>